Let's read the story of Pentecost now from the Bible. If you've got your Bible with you, you can open up to Acts chapter 2. Otherwise, uh, the words will also be on the screen. Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and they said, oh, They've had too much to drink, too much wine. At the beginning of our Bible passage today, the disciples are in a time of waiting and uncertainty. In the past few months, their lives have been turned upside down. They've been through a lot as, as Jesus was arrested and betrayed and crucified, and they grieved his death. And then they witnessed the surprising joy of his resurrection. Now, Jesus has left them and ascended to heaven. And they wonder, what's next? They don't know what the future will look like. Jesus didn't give them a five-year strategic plan. They don't even know what next week will look like. What they do know is that Jesus told them, to wait in Jerusalem for the gift of the Holy Spirit. They have that next step. They remember all that Jesus has told them about this promised Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit will come and be their comforter, their teacher, and the one who will lead them in truth, that the Holy Spirit will give them power to be his witnesses. And so, in the face of their uncertainty, those first followers of Jesus cling to those promises. They continue to gather together and to encourage each other, praying and waiting for God's empowerment in his timing. That feeling of, of waiting for direction in the face of uncertainty is a familiar one for us. I don't know about you, but it feels like we're in a bit of a season of waiting as well. The longer, in the midst of, of another stay-at-home order, at times it feels like life has been put on pause. Things get postponed and delayed and then postponed again and delayed again. We wait for word on when this will end, when we can see our friends and family again, when we can go back to normal. But even as I think about going back to normal, I find myself wondering about what back to normal will even look like. The longer all of this goes on, the, the more likely it seems that things will change and that our new normal could be quite different than how things were before. And that can create some anxiety and uncertainty it's challenging to prepare and plan when we don't quite know what's going to happen next. I think of the challenges our finance team went through as they carefully put together the budget for this year. They worked hard and put in many hours coming up with, with different scenarios and different things that could work depending on if this happens or if this happens. 
all trying to help us figure out how we can be good stewards of our resources in the times that we're living in. It's hard to know what the future will hold. How long will it be till we can be gathered together in person again and I can look out and see all of your wonderful faces here? How quickly will everyone be comfortable coming back right away? What will that transition be like? What challenges might people be going through in, in their own lives? And how does all of that impact how we use our resources and spend and what ministry will look like in this coming season? There are lots of questions. Perhaps today, you're experiencing a time of uncertainty in your own personal life, either brought about by this pandemic or by circumstances completely unrelated to COVID-19. Things have changed, and you wonder, what's next? Is this really the program I'm supposed to be studying? Will I be able to get a job in my field now that I've graduated? Will I be able to stay in the place where I'm living right now? Like the disciples, in, in these times of uncertainty, we continue to gather and to pray. We continue to encourage each other and remind each other that God's promises to us. We continue through on YouTube and on Zoom calls and through phone calls. We continue to connect with each other. We pray for God to show us what he would have us do. And we pray for his spirit to empower us for mission. To give us what we need to live into the callings he's given us as individuals and as a community. Our text this morning invites us to wait with expectant hope for what we know God will do. We know that in God's timing, he keeps his every promise. As we look back on the past, we've seen how faithful he's been. And that gives us hope in uncertain times to know that the promises he's made, he'll be faithful in the future. We may not know what the future will hold or what it will look like exactly. And God may work in ways that surprise us and challenge us. But we can trust that God will work, that he will be faithful, and that he will accomplish his purposes. Pentecost certainly surprises and challenges the followers of Jesus in our text this morning. They're gathered together waiting and praying when, when suddenly something extraordinary happens. From the heavens, there's a sound. The word used in Greek to describe that sound is the same word that would use for a sound that would accompany a, a news report or a herald. The kind of sound that, that gets your attention and, and tells you that something important is about to happen. Then, what appear to be tongues of fire come and rest on each person. It's amazing, beyond anything that the disciples have seen before. Every sense is, is engaged as the Spirit fills them. They hear it, they see it, they experience it. And then the sound of the wind turns into the sound of many languages being spoken at the same time. The voices themselves are, are heralds announcing the good things that God has done in languages that people from around the world can see, can hear, and can understand. A crowd gathers in amazement. What's going on? This is like nothing they've seen or heard before. Some are eager to hear more about what the disciples have to say about this Jesus. Others mock what they don't understand. Oh, they're just drunk. When I heard the story of Pentecost growing up, I was amazed by the way the Holy Spirit worked in this story and in others like it throughout the book of Acts. There was the speaking to people in visions, building the church through signs and wonders, giving the disciples power to even heal the sick. I wasn't so sure that 
God still worked in those kinds of ways in our world today. Then, partway through high school, something happened that changed the way I read the book of Acts. There was a revival at a local Pentecostal church, and I witnessed the charismatic gifts of the Holy Spirit in operation as I experienced a totally different kind of worship than I was used to. Suddenly, I heard people praying in tongues. There were times when the pastor would pray for people, and and they would just fall over and someone would catch them. There was a giddy excitement and sense of anticipation for what God was going to do. It was all so strange to me at the time, and yet it was powerful. I have this one memory that I don't think I'll ever forget of of this middle-aged man dressed in a suit at front of church, just dancing and singing, I am free to run, I am free to dance, I am free to live for you. I didn't know that man's story or who he was, but as I watched him worship, I saw such joy on his face, such freedom, and I saw the Holy Spirit at work transforming his life. That experience brought up a lot of questions for me about the person and work of the Holy Spirit, about the nature of worship, and about what it meant for me as a high school student to live out my faith. A few years later, when I was in university, our denomination came out with a study committee report on third wave Pentecostalism. I read the report eagerly, and it was incredibly helpful. It it helped me start to gain a clearer understanding of things like prophecy, prayer, healing ministry, and spiritual warfare. At the end of the day, I, I learned that our denomination affirms the gifts of the Spirit mentioned in the Bible. It affirms that they they continue to be operational today. Of course, we have to use discernment as we engage with these different gifts, as they have been abused by people over the years. But we ought to be open to the spirits moving. If I'm honest, I still have a lot of questions about the person and work of the Holy Spirit. I don't have it all figured out yet. If anything, God's been teaching me over the past number of years in my life that when I think I have things all figured out, I really don't. God can't be put in a box. He's bigger than what I can wrap my mind around. And he continues to show up in our world today in ways that surprise me. As he empowers his people for ministry. In the Christian Reformed Church, we have this beautiful summary of the teachings of the Bible in a contemporary testimony called, Our World Belongs to God. I love how it describes the work of the Holy Spirit, so let me read that to you. At Pentecost, promises old and new are fulfilled. The ascended Jesus becomes the baptizer, drenching his followers with his spirit, creating a new community where Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make their home. Revived and filled with the breath of God, women and men, young and old, dream dreams and see visions. The Spirit renews our hearts and moves us to faith, leads us in truth and helps us to pray, stands by us in our need and makes our obedience fresh and vibrant. God the Spirit lavishes gifts on the church in astounding variety. Prophecy, encouragement, healing, teaching, service, tongues, discernment, equipping each member to build up the body of Christ and to serve our neighbors. The Spirit gathers people from every tongue, tribe, and nation into the unity of the body of Christ. Anointed and sent by the Spirit, the church is thrust into the world, ambassadors of God's peace, announcing forgiveness and reconciliation, proclaiming the good news of grace. Going before them and with them, the Spirit convinces the world of sin and pleads the cause of Christ. Men and women, impelled by the Spirit, go next door and far away into science and art, media and marketplace, every area of life, pointing to the reign of God with what they do and say. The contemporary testimony highlights the same truth that our text today does. The Holy Spirit empowers the church for mission. When the Holy Spirit comes upon the disciples in our text this morning, he doesn't just give them a wonderful experience of his presence with them and his faithfulness to them. 
He affirms the calling that Jesus gave to them, and he empowers them to live into that calling. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, he said to the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, as they receive the Holy Spirit, the disciples begin to do just that. They begin proclaiming the wonders of God in many languages, giving witness to what God has done. If we were to keep reading in Acts 2 this morning, we would read about Peter delivering a, a remarkable message. Peter, the same disciple who a few months earlier denied even knowing Jesus. Peter, the fisherman with no theological training. Peter, who had no experience standing up and talking to large crowds. That same Peter gets up and starts preaching on Pentecost. He gives witness to Jesus as he unpacks the Old Testament and scriptures and shows how they are fulfilled through Christ. Both here and, and throughout the pages of Acts, the Holy Spirit continues to give the disciples the power they need to live into the calling that Jesus gave them. The disciples perform miracle after miracle, and, and all of them point to Jesus. Through the Holy Spirit's power, the church continues to witness to Jesus in Jerusalem, in Samaria and Judea, and to the ends of the earth. Whether you're a follower of Jesus already or, or whether you're taking this in and are just curious about faith and trying to figure out more, you're listening to this message today because of the work and witness of the Holy Spirit. Over hundreds of years, the Holy Spirit has continued to empower the church and continued to give followers of Jesus all that they need to witness to Jesus. The news of Jesus has spread around the world and lives have been transformed. The role that the Holy Spirit plays in, in mission is good news for us today. It gives us confidence and, and hope because at the end of the day, we, we remember that the church, the church, big, big C church, and the church, our community of Hope Fellowship Church, belong to God. It's not up to us to try to build or grow the church on our own strength or ability, or according to our own plans. We have the privilege of joining God in the mission that he's already begun in our midst, in our community, and in our neighborhoods. We also see that the Holy Spirit can give imperfect, broken people the strength and power to live into what God is calling them to do. The spreading of the gospel is, is not solely dependent upon the, the talent or skill of the disciples. It's dependent upon their desire to live in obedience to God's calling on their lives and their openness to letting God work through them. That same Holy Spirit is able to work through you and I, despite our shortcomings, our failings, and our imperfections. Over the next six weeks, I'm excited that we're going to get to continue to lean into this theme of discovering more and learning more about the Holy Spirit. As we hear from different speakers, each one will bring a, a different perspective and different insights that will help us to grow and explore and learn more. My encouragement to each of us in this series is that we would be open. Open to learning more about the Holy Spirit. Open to experiencing the Spirit's power open to hearing God's calling on our lives as individuals and a community, knowing that when God calls, he always equips and provides. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, we thank you for being at work in amazing ways throughout the story of the church. Thank you for 
how you empowered and equipped those first followers of Jesus and how you've continued to empower and equip followers of Jesus throughout the years. Thank you for continuing to be at work in our lives too. We pray that you would continue to move in us. As you came upon the early church in a mighty wind, we pray that you would blow into our lives in a fresh and new way. Blow far from us all dark despair, all deep distress, all groundless fears, all false values, all selfish wishes, all wasteful worries. Blow into us your holy presence, your living love, your healing touch, your splendid courage, your mighty strength, your perfect peace, your caring concern, your divine grace, your boundless joy. May every breath we breathe in remind us of your presence, and may every breath we breathe out be an expression of thanksgiving to you for who you are and for all that you've done for us. Amen.